Good morning and welcome to the weekly or the bi-weekly uh, series, uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Series. My name is Dr. Lou Freund. I'm a professor in industrial and systems engineering. How many industrial and systems engineering students do I have here? Please be proud, be proud. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was the last unscripted part of this, uh, by the way. Uh, so I uh, am happy today to introduce Mr. Taylor Stansbury, Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Intuit Incorporated. Mr. Stansbury earned a BA with honors in applied mathematics from Harvard University in 1983. He also completed graduate work at Stanford University in computer science, linguistics, and mathematics. Shortly after getting his BA degree, he did research in computational linguistics at Xerox, Xerox Park, then worked as a staff engineer and project leader at Sun Microsystems for three years. He moved on to be a manager of tools and libraries at Borland International, where he worked on components of Turbo Pascal and Turbo C++. His 15 years experience in executive engineering and management roles began at Xerox, where he was a VP of engineering and general manager of document management software systems, and at Calico Commerce, where he helped take the company public. In 2001, he became the executive vice president of products and operations at Ariba, where he led product management, engineering, hosting, and customer support. He then went on to become Chief Information Officer of VMware in 2007. Mr. Stansbury joined Intuit Incorporated in May 2009. He is Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer and is responsible for all product engineering and information technology. Mr. Stansbury serves on the board of directors for Coupa Software and has also served on the board of directors for several nonprofit organizations. He is currently a trustee and chair of the Advancement Committee at Harvey Mudd College. Once again, for the first time, please help me welcome Mr. Taylor Stansbury, Executive Vice President. and Chief Technology Officer of Intuit Incorporated. <laughs> Thank you so much. My, um, my format here today is maybe a little different than what you've seen in the past for this series. I have been asked to interview Mr. Stansbury as opposed to having him give a talk and have him simply speak about some topics that we thought, he thought, that you might find most relevant and interesting for yourselves. So as I said, I have a uh, list of uh, items to reveal to him, but I think he's already seen them and thought about them some. And at the end of this, we'll allow you to ask, we'll offer and ask you to ask any questions that you have on your mind. We have a whole hour that we can spend on this, and I don't think it'll take us that long to go through this list of things that have been prepared. So let me start off, if I might, with the first page. <clears throat> sort of getting to know you on a personal level. I understand you are a parent of college-age kids. Yes, I am. That's what I've been told. Could you share more? What was your advice to them when it came time to select a college? So I have uh, <clears throat> a kid in high school and two in college at UCSB and one who just graduated from Harvey Mudd. And uh, my advice to them who has been you know, focus on something that you're deeply passionate mm -hmm. about. Make sure that that's technical. You can always go softer later. <laughs> um, and uh, so far, they've actually listened to me, which is a miracle. A surprise. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> Did you know at an early age uh, that you wanted to be a technologist? Yeah, um, uh, from quite an early age. I. Uh, uh, just sort of had interest in that direction. My mom had actually worked as a programmer at the Federal Reserve 
for many years, and she taught me to program when I was eight. And so that became a bug at an early age and never quite went away. You had uh, no interest in what your father was doing? At Not, the time? No, my, my father was a lawyer. He, uh, he did international corporate finance. He loved it, but it was something that really didn't have I'm much interest I'm familiar with the feeling, I, I yeah. might add, yeah. 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 Can you describe for us what a chief, I hope you can, what a chief technology officer does at Intuit? Uh, uh, because <laughs> you are the chief technology officer at Intuit. I think Intuit. so, um, unless something so changed since I left. what does a chief technology officer do? So I, I look after all of our product engineering and, and our um, information technology, our hosting. Uh, let me just to take a step back and maybe say a word about Intuit, if that's all right. Sure, that's cool. So um, you, you probably all know products like TurboTax or Mint. Uh, we make those. And uh, QuickBooks, perhaps, um, if you have a friend who runs a small business, uh, we make that as well. Uh, as part of our QuickBooks suite of, of offerings, we have a payroll solution. Um, it pays about one out of 12 Americans. And uh, we also have a payment solution um, that's in integrated with QuickBooks. So that's some of the stuff that we do. The company is about 30 years old. Our very first product was Quicken, which was a personal finance product. And uh, we've evolved since then through both organic growth and also acquisitions, um, some of which have done very well and some not so much. Um, and uh, we're today pushing towards $5 billion in revenue, about 30% uh, profitability. And um, we have about 8,000 employees, about uh, 4,000 of which are in technology of some form. Let's talk about your career journey. You were at Xerox in the early 80s and then moved to a much smaller, faster moving company at the time called Sun Microsystems. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why, Xerox. Why did you make the move? Is, yeah, I want to start with Xerox because it, Xerox was a really fun um, place, the Palo Alto Research Center in the mid 80s, which is when I was there. And uh, you know, a lot of the computer technology that we're familiar with today was actually invented um, at that time or slightly before at Xerox PARC. Um, so the mouse came from before, that was from SRI, but pretty much all the other stuff like raster displays, ethernet, um, uh, print servers, um, uh, you know, print description languages, uh, windowing, uh, multilingual systems with a single way of representing characters in multiple languages, all was invented by you know, Xerox PARC at that, at that period of time. So as you might imagine, it was a fascinating place to be. The parent company, of course, was a copier company, and so they got the whole idea of the laser printer that came out of PARC as well. Um, it, had a, it had toner in it, so they understood it. Uh, the rest of the stuff, not so much. And most of the technology that leaked out from PARC came in the form of people running off and starting their own companies like 3Com and Adobe, um, and became very successful at that but not so much things that came out of Park directly that were computer technology. And so um, even though there were a bunch of really amazingly brilliant people to work with there and cool things to work on, there wasn't a very direct path to market. And so what I wanted to do is do something that had a more direct path to market, and that's why I went to Sun Microsystems, which was sort of in the middle of its early growth period at the time that I joined there. Is in my recollection, Sun was the apple of the day. It was the place to be in the valley. It was a, a real star in those days, I know. Yeah, at the time we, uh, we blew past first Apollo, which nobody remembers anymore, no. then HP. Then HP bought Apollo and we blew past the combination of them during the time that I was there. So it was a fast Sun, growing company. Sun is at the time. still remember. If, if any, how many of you have heard of Sun Microsystems? Oh, good. So you've seen the Sun logo? The Sun logo is still re <laughs> remembered as one of the coolest logos that's ever been designed. It, it has no S in it. It's just all hooks. It makes you think there are S's there, but there really aren't. After Sun, you did a stint at Borland, probably another uh, star in those days, I know. Yeah, I'm sure nobody remembers that any longer. I do, but I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> they did a bunch of cool languages, products, and um, database, and so forth, so yeah. Sure. Uh, you returned to Xerox then, and why was that? They, they didn't learn the first time. Um, so <laughs> the, the project that I returned to was one that uh, required somebody who had Sun experience and PC experience, mm -hmm. um, Sun for the back end, PC for the front end, and, uh, uh, and also who understood Xerox culture. So I may have been the one person in the world who was the right candidate for that role. So they, they lured me back for that, and that was a lot of fun. 
so then you jumped over to the Internet 1.0, joining Calico. I noticed that the company's stock price quadrupled right after its IPO. I'm sure that was a wild ride. Can you describe life during the online <laughs> gold rush? Uh, yeah, a bit crazy. Um, all about you know going and uh, acquiring new customers, and uh, uh, so and it's, it's you know at some point in your career, doing a startup is a good thing to do if you if you can do that. And that's the way I felt when I went and joined that company. And it was pre-IPO when I joined. Um, took us a few quarters to, to go out and get public. Um, that was a, a wild ride. Uh, it, the stock rode up very, very quickly. And then you may remember what happened after that. There was the whole dot-com crash. And about half of the customers whom we supplied with our product, was, which was uh, uh, B2B e-commerce um, uh, sort of sales-related tools, um, configurators and things of that ilk. Um, half of those customers were enterprise customers, so they were steady, but half of our customers were dot-com customers, and that entire customer base evaporated more or less overnight. And then, as you might imagine, so did the stock value of the company evaporate overnight, and um, bad things ensued. So then you left that company. Probably. Yes, I, I was assume, asked to leave along with the entire executive right staff. <laughs> <laughs> along with everybody else. So I know you had a couple more jobs, Ariba and VMware, before landing at Atuit. Intuit. What was it about Intuit that made it appealing? Yeah, Intuit is a is a um, it's a neat company. It's maybe one of the best kept secrets in Silicon Valley, um, and I think perhaps because people know the brands of our products better than the name of our of our company. Um, but it's a modest company. It's a company with I think a really great culture. Um, we do actually hire a fair number of San Jose State students every year, about thirty last year. Um, so if anybody's interested. Uh, the, the, um, the products that we make, I think, are ones that solve real problems in people's financial lives. Uh, they're interesting. They're complicated as you, when you start getting down into the, um, into the weeds. At, on the surface, you think about tax and accounting. How could that possibly be interesting? But like many things in life, when you start getting down into the fractal detail, it, it gets quite rich and interesting indeed. So we serve tens of millions of customers. So there's a fair amount of scale. The data that we have to help serve those customers is, is fascinating data. So there's a lot of big data systems, machine learning, AI, um, to simplify the business of people's financial lives and make things that are you know, daunting and scary, um, like compliance, tax, accounting, um, payments, et cetera, actually very easy and safe um, so that, you know, for example, last year, we had about 6 million people filed their tax returns on a you know, um, small mobile phone and uh, had a great experience doing that in, in a very short period of time, um, in part by taking pictures of, of tax forms that need to be ingested, in part by getting data from the internet and a uh, very fast experience. And so that's obviously dri driven by um, big data, machine learning, and uh, ultimately some, some AI systems, old school and new school alike. So what would it be like managing thousands of employees and driving billions in revenue? <laughs> what, what is that? Well, what do you yeah, do first every day? The, the, the good news is it's not a lot different than managing a team of, let's say, 100 or so people. Uh -huh. and, and I would say the reason for that is that at some point, you know, when you're managing small, smaller groups of people, you can know what everybody is doing and have an idea of that and where they're running into roadblocks and how you can help with removing roadblocks so that they can get their things done, give them clear vision so that they can go forward. But at some point you get to where you have a group that's large enough, you can't possibly understand what everybody is doing. And you're relying on you know, managing through managers to actually get done what you want to accomplish um, to achieve you know, overall goals. And uh, uh, once you've gone through that first level of abstraction, the next level of abstraction after that and the one after that are really no, no different. And it really does boil down to, um, to, to manage a scale, clear vision of what you're gonna do, clear vision of how you're going to execute that um, uh, so everybody sort of knows what they're, what they're supposed, to be, supposed to be up to. The vision needs to obviously be broken down into small enough bites so that everybody understands what's immediately next and they don't get lost in a big empty space of, a, of an enormous vision. Um, and then the other key, of course, is having awesome people working for you as managers uh, to help direct the efforts at you know, the, the different layers beyond. And so it does mean a little bit more of your time starts shifting towards how do you build an awesome organization? Because that's what you rely on in order to get done, you know, hopefully amazing technology things. 
Thank you. What are some of the trends you see in the engineering world? Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, one of the things that's really nice about this field is it changes all the time, so uh, there's always new things to learn. Um, I would hate to be in a field where that weren't true. But uh, you know, there's some areas, and there's some areas that are new, and there's some areas that are rewarmed old areas that are coming back into, into vogue or have new purposes. But some obvious ones would include big data, uh, uh, machine learning, um, AI in general, which I think is in probably its third major resurgence at this point, uh, with some new approaches that are making things better. Voice, alternative reality, virtual reality. And so these are all areas that we're, as you might imagine, working in aggressively. Intuit allows their engineers to spend 10% of their time working on projects of their own choosing. Yeah. I understand that ability to, that the ability to file your tax return by taking a picture of it on your phone came out of this program. Yeah. What other innovative, cool ideas has this spawned? Yeah, when we start with, the, if, if you've got tasks assigned to you, they may be interesting um, and, and rich things, but I think everybody needs a little bit of time to dream. And, um, and then a lot of times what you dream about uh, turn out to be the next innovation that might be a feature of a product or a product in and of its own right that we wouldn't have had if, if you know, all your work were directed by you know, your manager. And so being able to tell your manager to go away for 10% of your time and go work on the things that you think are gonna be most compelling for the future I think is, is actually very, very freeing and, and we get actually a lot of benefit out of that as well. So we've had a number of different uh, offerings. You mentioned the um, imaging to, to help with getting your taxes done. That was one, one thing that came out of that time. Another example would be our mobile solutions for accountants. Um, all the initial ones of those were built um, in unstructured time. Another example would be for our payroll solution that I mentioned before, um, being able to look at the contents of your paycheck if you're being paid with that solution. How many hours did you actually get credit for? Because a lot of these guys are hourly workers. Um, that solution was actually built in unstructured time by a couple of engineers. The uh, View My Paycheck, is that the one yeah, yeah, you're referring yeah. to? Um, you had some new offerings, uh, that's true, but you have uh, innovations that have been internal tools as well, right? Yeah, many of those, um, <clears throat> and uh, some of them have to do with services that are used by various other applications um, that have gotten high adoption. Some of them had to do with uh, relationships with uh, customers. So uh, we have a, a, a new way of interacting with customers to help get their taxes done, which we'll be rolling out very soon. That came from unstructured time. Uh, we, we also have um, some ways of keeping customers retained and making it easier for them to maintain continuity and billing um, that came out of another unstructured time project. So as you can see, these things can have pretty big impact to the business as well as be a great outlet for engineers to um, think about new things. What have you found to be the most difficult issues that young graduates tend to struggle with as they transition from college to their first real job? What can they do while still in school to mitigate such struggles? I, I don't know about in general, but I'll tell you my, my own personal experience uh, was that nearly every project I worked on in school was an individual project and not, not a team-based project. And, and I think what you find is that most of the interesting things in life when you get done with school are things that actually require pretty large bodies of people to get done. Um, so you're gonna be working in, in teams. And as a you know, uh, natural introvert nerd, um, I found that to be a hot, personally a hard transition to make. Um, and so that took some adjustment time. And uh, uh, it, it, so that, that was the biggest thing I think I struggled with. So I guess the advice that I would give is if you do have opportunity to sign up for um, any classes that are project-based uh, or go out and do any internships during the course of, of summers, I would strongly recommend doing that to help acclimate. Let me take a risky leap here. How many of you are involved in team projects right now? Awesome. So yeah, I, I thought so, but I, I wanted to just be sure that we understand. You got a picture of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, team projects are actually, I think, the model that the uh, accreditation board is requiring now for engineering undergraduates. So, that's, that's a really So that's thing. one change that's happened in the last 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> so any final comments is the next, uh, and these are not final comments, but these are the <laughs> final listed comments. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so I guess, you know, if I, if I were to give any, any uh, advice, it would be 
pick a thing that you're interested in and then go at it hammer and tongs with all your energy. <coughs> and what you'll frequently find, at least what I found, um, as, as I'm sure you could hear from that somewhat embarrassing recap of my resume, uh, is that I've done a lot of different things over the course of my career. And each one of them, um, it turned out serendipitously, ended up drawing on several things I'd learned in the previous thing, even though they were very different. And, and, and I've always found that uh, trying really hard at a particular thing means that even if I end up doing something which is 30 or 90 degrees off of that next, there's some cognate learnings that happen from working hard at the first thing that really benefit in the second. So standing by the sidelines and not being sure, um, uh, I'm not sure that benefits, I'm not sure that gets you further forward versus picking something, going at it, and then pivoting and pivoting and pivoting. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that takes us to the end of the prepared questions. I had one question I'd like to just raise Shoot. with you that caught my eye. You're both Chief Technology Officer and exec EVP, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of companies have those two roles separated. They're often not in the same direction. I wonder how you keep yourself together sometimes between trying to advance technology but keeping operations in line as not, well. Not always successfully. CTO is a funny title because it can mean everything from chief architecture guy to uh, with nobody reporting to them to you know the chief operations guy for you know running a technology organization and I think we're more the the latter of those and mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say that the the it, it sounds like they're two different things but they're really not um, in the sense that as I talked about earlier if you're going to lead a team anywhere interesting it's really important to have a vision of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and to help, you know, get other people to help you put that vision together and evolve it over time, and then figure out how to break it down into the pieces that people can get done next quarter, the quarter after that, the year after that, um, so that you can accomplish something that may take years to, to get done ultimately, but everybody's clear on what needs to get done, and you have things that will benefit the world coming out at every stage along the way. Um, and so, you know, I think there's actually some enormous benefit to being able to both dream and have the organizational executional capability to carry that off to change the world and make it hopefully a better place in some dimension. Thank you. We uh, have good time left for questions from you as an audience and I believe we have some microphones that we can move around. So if you have a question, there's one right here in front, we can uh, begin. So I had a question just like on how you kind of went from company to company. Did you worry about like job stability or did you just kind of like one hoping that like it was the next big thing or you had a good like you had good feelings about the company? Yeah, it, um, it's not something that I think I worry about um, on a general basis. Uh, it, when it, sometimes a job gets to where it's pretty clear it's time to go do something else because something is changing. I mean, at the time I left Xerox, by then I'd been asked to be general manager of a um, division that was doing a variety of print management and document management products, and my revenue target got raised by 5x in one year, and I knew I wasn't going to succeed at that. Um, and so it was felt like a really good time to, to leave, good and that's when I went yeah. to, yeah. you know, to a startup company. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think I've been lucky in choosing some companies that were and in a growth phase at the time that I, I joined them. Um, but let me give one example. When I made the transition to Ariba, I actually got four offers before I, you know, uh, from different companies when I joined that company. And I took the offer, which was Ariba, which had um, the lowest compensation of all of the jobs I got offered. Why did I do that? It's because I liked the people better. <clears throat> I liked the company culture better. And I thought that their products actually had more uh, potential for the future, um, and so that's why I made that choice. And I think it was the right one because all three of those other companies are out of business now. So is Ariba, but they got bought by SAP. But yeah, could you expand a little bit on what you mean by company culture? I don't know that everybody here has mm -hmm. had a lot of experience relevant to culture and companies. And what does that mean to you? What, what are you thinking about? That's a great question. It's sort of the feeling of the company when you're there. Um, is the company principles-based or are they simply aiming at profits? <clears throat> um, are they trying to make the world a better place or not? How do people treat each other within the company? What are the norms around that? 
Is that something that the company works at to try to make better and better every year? Um, and I think those are things that, for example, Intuit does you know, pretty well, actually very well, um, and it's the reason why, why I'm there. What, what could a group of entry-level graduates look for to reflect culture? Look for the feel when you walk in to go for an interview. And some places you walk in at, you know, towards the end of a day and what do you smell is sweat and adrenaline. Um, that may not be where you want to be. Um, if, you, if, you, if you walk into a place and you see people who are warm with each other um, and who seem to care about what they're doing and care about each other, um, my guess is that that'll be a place you'll find more home. Other questions? Um. Uh, I used to work in wealth management, so I have experience with Intuit Solutions, but they seem very configured to the U.S. market. So what is Intuit's presence internationally, or how are they going to expand that way? Yeah, great question. Yeah, we're still about 95% North American in our revenue, so U.S., Canada. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that is that, uh, it, you know, compliance-related products are very hard to make work in other regions. So there are a lot of very subtle differences, not just language, not just currency, those are easy, uh, but in regulatory environments, how people, what documents people expect to have to run businesses, um, uh, what compliance documents they have to share with governments, et cetera, et cetera. And so tailoring for each of the, of the locales is, is, is difficult. Um, that's one cause. Another cause is that uh, 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 We've been able to grow in the U.S. so well that for a long period of time, we actually decided not to bother about international. I think it was a great mistake, by the way, um, because we were able to grow so well in the U.S. And uh, so I would say most companies of our age and size would have more than half of their revenue from outside the U.S., and we're certainly not there. It's an area we're working at very aggressively now, so we are um, aggressively trying to grow in the U.K., um, in France, in Brazil, in India, um, Australia, uh, to cite a few examples. Were there other companies that saw that gap and your success and took advantage of it? Yes, <laughs> which makes it a bit of a struggle now, but um, I think we've got a strategy to, Good. to nail that. Uh, my question was how, when, and where in your career did uh, your role in management begin, and how was that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, you know, again, I, as a introvert nerd engineer, I viewed management as the dark side. Um, still kind of do. Um, and uh, there was a juncture when I was at, at Sun when I'd been working on a project for about a year, and it failed. And it failed not because I didn't write the code I was supposed to write, um, I like to think, but because it, of, you know, there were some other people on the team who didn't get done the pieces that they needed to and the integrations didn't work and we had to scrub it and, and, and do a hard reset on the project. And at the time, my director came to me and said, hey, do you, do you want to run this project? And I think I actually said, are you on drugs? <laughs> so, lack of editing function. Um, and then I went home and I thought about it for a couple of days and I sheepishly came back in and said, hey Dave, um, if you're still open to that, I'd, I'd love, to, love to give that a shot. And he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. <laughs> so, um, and the thing that in my mind, and I, I wanna say this was my choice and not necessarily the choice that everybody in this room should make, um, was, hey, I can, either go work on some corner of some project for the rest of my life that fails because it's not being led well, or I can put myself in a position of leading projects so they have as close to 100% success rate as possible. And um, so that's why I made that choice. Now, I totally struggled with that choice for two years, and um, uh, partly because I viewed it as the dark side, uh, but also partly because every day I'd come in and I'd have a piece of code that I wanted to write, I had a hard time really giving up, you know, writing software um, that I was supposed to do. But then there was all these other people on the team that I was leading who were, you know, working on things and they were stuck in some problem. They needed something to be unwedged. And what's the higher le leverage thing to do? Is it to do your own stuff or to unleverage, unwedge the rest of, of your team? And it always turns out, of course, to be fix the problem that's in the way of the team. And then you realize, hey, you know, I'm the one who's not getting his code done. This is not good. And eventually, that's when I realized I needed to admit that I'd been assimilated. 
There's one here. A couple. So building upon the same question that you said of making the shift from being technical into the management, what would be some of the learning skills you have in managing people, especially now in most companies of those multi-generational, so there are different approaches. So can you share some things? Um, I think, again, I'll go back. In, in terms of managing people, one of the key things is going to be vision. Where, what's the long-term thing you're trying to get everybody to move towards? And how are you making that vision update itself as you learn more things, as they teach you more things? Um, and then how do you sequence that work in ways that will actually get things out there that will impact the world in a positive way? Um, increasingly, though, another part of it becomes the talent that you hire uh, to, to carry out the stuff that you're trying to build as a company. And that's a, an ever-changing thing. So what can happen is that technologies shift. And into it, as you might imagine, uh, we started out as a DOS company, right, on green screens with characters um, and dot matrix printers to print the checks from Quicken. And obviously we had to go through a transition from DOS to Windows, Windows to Web, Web to Mobile, um, and uh, now heading into, you know, voice and VR. So uh, there's a lot of technology, you know, change that has to happen in the course of that. And as you might imagine, not every engineer you hire is going to be uh, have the desire to or be ambidextrous enough to learn every new technology as it comes along. And sometimes it's a really good idea to infuse people who really have done it before um, and can help guide other people. And uh, so sometimes there's a, a shift in, in talent um, hiring that you've got to do. And so that's a big piece of, of management is looking at your team, looking at the problem ahead and saying, do I have the team today that will match that problem ahead? And if I don't, then can I train them to get there, or do I have to bring in some leavening from outside to um, bring in critical skills? This one right here in the center. Um, how are the engineers who uh, create innovations, like major innovations, during the 10% free time uh, compensated? That's a great question. Um, sometimes not at all, because sometimes there's the things that they work on, uh, I mean, they get paid for their job, right? But the things that they work on don't actually bear much fruit. Not everything does. Um, but sometimes uh, they, they, they are. And so we have an award series that's given out by our founder every year, um, and where several teams get honored for work that they've done that's been particularly impactful, new to the world uh, innovations uh, that, that have had real impact or, um, uh, for, for Intuit. And the thing that, what, that they get is they get some monetary compensation for that, but that's not what they really care about so much as we actually free them up for three months or six months half time um, to go work on their next innovation outside of you know, management control. And what happens with that is that a lot of these guys use that time to come up with the next innovation that they win an award for um, so you end up with a lot of serial innovators as a, as a consequence of that. That's sort of an internal hackathon kind of a model? or do you, do Well, you we do things? do internal hackathons uh, in various of our groups at various times, for sure. Um, but it's more, you know, if you win an innovation award, the award you get is monetary, but it's also time. Time to go do the next innovation. There's some back here on the... Hi, uh, did you ever try connecting the docs to figure out that you wanted to be an engineer? And also, did you ever have any times where you regretted choosing the career path to be an engineer? <laughs> um, you mean choosing to be technical or in engineering in the very, very first place? Yeah. Um, again, I would say that it's from a fairly early age that I knew I wanted to make things. And uh, I wasn't really quite sure what. Um, I, I did get involved with programming from a very early age, uh, that, uh, but then I developed other interests over time. At the time I went to college, I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to do architecture, make things like buildings, um, physics, uh, uh, biology, or computer science. I ended up choosing biology because I'd managed to get a job at the NIH and FDA working in immunology, and I decided at the time I wanted to do, you know, research in in, in that field. Um, I got about halfway through college and, 
and I, and I had a point of realization where I took a computer science class as I got and, and uh, realized how much I missed it and, and how much I loved it. And there was a fundamental difference for me, and again, this is everybody's gonna make their own choices about their career, but for me, what I observed is if you're doing an experiment in immunology, uh, then as in vivo, let's say, um, it might take you a couple hours to figure out what problem you're trying to, uh, and what, what truth about immunology you're trying to answer, trying to find out what the mechanism is, how it works. Um, and design what the experiment is. It might take you three weeks of work with animals or immunochemistry to um, actually carry out the experiment, and then you get a result. And the result, of course, makes no sense because it doesn't match your model of the world. And then you spend a few hours thinking about what it might mean, what experiment you might design next. But what that means is that you're spending about 5%, 10% of your time on experimental design and wondering how the universe works, and about 90% of your time doing stuff in a laboratory versus with computer science for me, what I found is the ratio is about opposite. The whole time you're doing architecture, you're writing code, you're debugging code, and all of it felt like it was a intellectual activity. And to me, that's you know what attracted me back to the field and, and I got stuck there. And I don't regret that field. Sometimes I regret management. <laughs> See, there's one down here. A couple, actually. You talked a bit about uh, company culture. How, as an executive at Intuit, are you affecting the company culture? Hopefully positively, most <laughs> days. Um, I think when I, uh, one aspect of culture is what you think about as a company. And I think we've always been really good about thinking about people and thinking about customers. Uh, we've had a very sort of customer-centric focus to our company and our founder. You know, part of how he learned, you know, what products to build is he would go out and do customer follow me homes, um, where uh, he would, you know, go and 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 watch customers or potential customers using either his products or competitive products to try to see what problems they were trying to solve and how the products could get better to. Solve, the, solve those gaps. And, and so I think we've always had that culture of being sort of very customer centric as a company. When I joined the company, we were not technology centric um, very much at all. And it was uh, very much, you know, what is the customer problem? And then the technology to solve it was an afterthought. And I think that what's happened in the period that I've been there with lots of help from lots of people is that we've gotten those to more of a co-equal status. So you think about what could be customer driven innovation and what could be innovation that comes from an observation about technology capability always in service to really solving the customer problem? And how do you do that in a way that creates durable advantage for, for the company? And uh, uh, you know, so several of the, of the things that we've delivered as products over the last few years, which wouldn't have been true several years ago, have been things that have come from deep technology uh, uh, ideation um, towards solving a customer problem. And so that how we're in the, in the process of rewriting our tax systems today is something that comes from a old observation around old school AI as to how it could be applied to tax systems in a way that's very, very weird. Um, and I think we'll take the rest of the industry by some surprise, uh, but we've protected with over 100 patents. Uh, I thought that there was another question back on this side too. Somebody over there? No, no. There was there. Okay. What are your opinions on making mistakes? Making opinion about making mistakes? Making mistakes. Because you're always because you're running a company and it's pretty much inevitable and inevitable to make mistakes. Is that true? Yeah, how many mistakes do I make in a day? I don't even know. Um, so one always makes mistakes and, and uh, uh, it isn't a question of, of you know, how many mistakes you make, but it's a question of what you learn from those mistakes and how you pivot from, from those mistakes to go do new things and how you don't make the same mistake over and over again. So I think that um, the latitude to make mistakes has got to be has got to be there because sometimes when you make a mistake, you actually learn something, you discover something new that you wouldn't have discovered if you hadn't bumped up against it. Uh, but it's sort of part of the whole evolution and learning process. But the key is, and you know, 
shaming people for making mistakes. The key is saying, okay, what did you learn from that? And um, now what are you going to do? Hi, Mr. Stansberry. You mentioned that how AI and machine learning may impact the industry and your uh, intuit in particular. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Because I think a lot of students are interested about you know, um, this new technology. Thank you. So uh, we, it's, it's a technology that we're applying, um, so AI and machine learning across various different disciplines in the company, but uh, maybe I'll give you know, one, one example of that would be an identification of fraud. So you know, anytime you are uh, building systems that move a lot of money around, give access to a lot of money, um, or give access to things that would give access to money, then there are going to be a lot of bad guys out there who are looking to um, go and find ways into those systems and exploit them. And uh, you know, given that we are in the space of tax, there's always a lot of tax fraud where people submit false returns in order to get a refund. Um, payroll, where people will try to sign up as a pay, get themselves signed up as a payee and siphon out money that way, or also payments where they can commit payments fraud. There's all kinds of opportunities for bad guys to try to play with our systems. And so one of the things that we've done with machine learning is to um, build systems that help identify oddities of behavior that would be indicative of fraud um, and then spread those across all the rest of the systems that we have uh, to hopefully make the world a safer place. I guess one over here. Um, building on the question of AI, uh, do you see AI as a in the future as a universal um, uh, thing that, like Elon Musk believes it'll be? Um, or do you see it as something that only um, certain countries will have and uh, as a power that is only unanimous to some countries? So, wow, great question. Um, so a AI has been through a number of hype cycles before, right? Let's, let's remember that, right? There was one in the 60s, one in the 80s, and one now. Um, I'm sure it won't live up to quite all the things that people hope that it will live up to now, although the approaches now are much more pragmatic than, um, than some of the approaches is earlier, and are more on sort of how do you simulate appropriate behavior um, as opposed to how do you actually get to deep understanding or deep natural language understanding as opposed to the super superficialities of that, which are much easier to solve. There is something different now, um, which is you know availability of computing power is much, much greater than it was during the earlier you know, um, uh, periods of, of AI popularity to the point where um, combined with taking a more pragmatic approach, we can get a lot more stuff done with, with AI. And if you um, think about you know, the rise of uh, public clouds and easy, cheap availability of burst compute when you need it, uh, then I think that brings it to much more of a ubiquitous thing where everybody can get get access to it, and hopefully for mostly good purposes. Is it the same zone as cognitive assistance, or is that a separate sure. topic? Sure, yeah. Same zone? Yeah. Because I've, I've been hearing that that's the dimension that we'll be all living in. So um, <clears throat> let me ask, are there any other questions? Yes, there is a question in the back. In the book, Lean Startup, um, your company was heavily referenced. The author kind of made it seem like you guys practice that methodology. Could, you, could you speak there, up just a little bit, please? In the book, Lean Startup by yes. Eric Rice, your company was really referenced, uh, like you guys use that methodology. Do you have, are there any drawbacks to that methodology? So uh, the, the whole idea of lean projects and minimum viable, you know, releasable things to go get experience with customers is, I think, pretty deeply in our DNA as a company. And it aligns very much with the whole idea of customer-centric product design uh, that I mentioned earlier and, and spending a lot of time with customers to understand not necessarily what they say, but what their actual problems are that you can see through, through observation. Um, one of the things that can be a, a scary, wasteful thing is to build a large project before you've really engaged very much with customers and the world to figure out whether your dream is actually aligned with reality or not, and it actually is going to work for customers. And I think the whole idea of Lean Start-In is, is um, very aligned with you know, starting small, 
um, experimenting you know, rapidly with customers, pivoting when you find out that your vision wasn't quite right, um, and pivoting again and pivoting again. Um, so that's something we absolutely do employ. Uh, the, the thing that I say the, the risk of that, if that's the only thing you do to how, how you innovate, is that um, it, it tends to lead to small observation, pivot, and vision as opposed to how do you complement that with a bigger vision that might be the sort of thing that you wouldn't get to by um, a, a local walk. Um, so, so I think if you can complement that with other overarching things about what is your mission as a company, why are you trying to do that, and then what might be some of the technologies or trends, um, sort of looking at the things from a more macro angle as a complement to what you do from the micro angle with Lean Start In, then I think you end up being in a pretty you know, strong place. Go ahead. Let me ask one question while the microphone's going up. Do you have any um, new products or current products that are sort of aimed at s sectors? We have students here in biomedical engineering. We have students in, interested in healthcare organizations. Do you have products that are, that are di directed towards sectors of the economy, uh, be it transportation or healthcare or? Not quite per se. So the not, customers not like that we, the, we serve are consumers with personal finance and tax, small businesses mm -hmm. with accounting, payroll, and payments, um, and then a bunch of complementary third-party products that we integrate with ours, and then accountants who help uh, small businesses grow and uh, help people sometimes do their taxes. So um, where nothing, we Nothing aligned to, a, to an outpatient clinic or, or a restaurant chain or restaurant. We have tried that in the past and haven't done particularly well. Mm -hmm. And I think where we end up doing our best is when we build horizontal products that other, other companies can come along mm -hmm. through our APIs and verticalize for different vertical markets that, um, that have particular needs. But I think where we excel is in building general systems that can serve financial systems that serve broad classes of, of uh, companies and, and people. Thank you. Over here, there was one. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I just had a quick question for you. You had mentioned that the Intuit is researching in uh, VR. Could you elaborate that on that a little bit? Uh, in um, alternate reality and, and virtual reality, yeah, we're looking at that, and we've been looking at it for the past several years as to where it might apply in our products. Um, one of the things that uh, you, you know you can obviously imagine in a small business um, pricing or product information showing up when you look at a product in the store. Um, in the AR space, you can imagine applications to inventory. Uh, in VR, you know, one of the things that's really cool is essentially it's an infinite space to write on. Um, and, and unlike the world we live in today where we have you know, screens that are this big or screens maybe this big, they're still very finite. There's only so much data you can put on that screen. And so you end up with sort of hierarchical navigation systems that are clumsy, don't give people good visualization of how pieces relate to each other, and so, so there's some of the things that we're working on. Um, so when it comes to the hiring process, what do you look for in, in an engineer who's coming straight out of college? Like, what do you look for, the values of an engineer? Great question. And it would depend to some degree on the job for which we're, we're hiring. Um, one of the things that I don't think is particularly important is a, is a uh, programming language skill in a particular language. Sometimes managers will look for that because it's convenient and then you can plug somebody in and they're ready to go right away. Um, I think that uh, what you really want to look for is does somebody have the intellectual capacity and the desire to learn so that as technology changes over the years that they'll be an employee, they're going to be able to adapt and stay current with that. Um, so that might be one, one big area to look for. And another big area to look for is um, are they accretive on a team? Are they going to work well on a team and make everybody else on the team stronger? So those would be two big things to look for. Oh, yes, here. Right here. Okay. So it's a follow-up on the same hiring process. I believe the recent trend, especially proponent of it being the XVP of uh, the Google saying that GPA is not like a correlation for high performance. What are your views and what would you specifically look for in making a hiring decision? You know, hiring is just a tricky thing. It's very hard to figure out what makes somebody tick in a one hour interview or series of one hour interviews with different people. Um, yeah, and you're right, you know, it, it is, it, it does, does seem to be the case that some of the 
people who turn out to be most extraordinary employees were not necessarily academically awesome. So people sort of blossom at different things and at different stages of their, of their lives. And the question is, can you spot that you know, um, with any degree of repeatability? And um, the answer is nobody's perfect at it. Um, the, one of the things that we do that I think is really the best way is to hire interns. Because then essentially what you get is a two or three month interview with somebody before offering them a full time you know, permanent job. Uh, to see how they really perform in your culture and your environment and on your technology with the people that would be around them. Um, of course, when you can't do that, when it isn't, let's say, an early career hire, um, one of the things that we do is um, craft demonstrations where we'll actually get a committee of people who are very good at assessing talent in a particular area and then have the candidate come in and prepare a little bit in advance and present on some, some craft area that's appropriate, whether that be design or engineering in a particular area or, um, or something else. And uh, that tends to give us a little bit better um, batting average on assessing whether somebody is going to be a great hire or not. So I think we have time for one more question. Hello. Uh, so the questions that were previously asked, I would like to know uh, what was like the biggest milestone of your life, like the thing that completely changed your life. Getting married? <laughs> <laughs> I think academically. Okay, the second biggest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Having kids? <laughs> okay, <Should> got I... <laughs> it. Okay, well, I think we've had an hour with you, and I think we know you pretty well right now. So let's, uh, do we hire him or not? Yeah. <laughs>